It can't be denied that SpaceX is exceptionally skilled at generating excitement among both its employees and fans. Even though Falcon Heavy's been operational again since late last year, each mission has left an indelible impression on viewers. Especially with the upcoming launch scheduled for August, SpaceX is set to present the Falcon Heavy with an unprecedented challenge, and it'll be far from easy. Let's find out everything about it in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Well, when Starship is gradually emerging to prove its potential, Falcon Heavy is no less. Last month, Falcon Heavy took a mission into geosynchronous orbit, and it's one of the most challenging mission types in the launch industry. For this reason, there was no need for SpaceX to have landing legs or even grid fins on a single one of the three boosters. As far as what happened to them, the boosters were expended by falling into the Atlantic Ocean after separation. However, note that the upper stage featuring a gray band at the top crucial to the success of the launch. Next, SpaceX is projected to use a Falcon Heavy to launch the Space Force's USSF-52 mission in July. While this is a secret government launch, Falcon Heavy has another upcoming launch in August that's poised to leave a lasting impression. So how? Earlier last week, SpaceX filed with the FCC to get permits to communicate before and during launch with the Falcon Heavy rocket and all its stages and boosters. Within that permit, it was quoted saying, the STA is necessary to authorize launch vehicle communications and two experimental first stage drone ship recovery operations of the side boosters for SpaceX Falcon Heavy Mission 1468, launching from Complex 39A Kennedy Space Center. Application includes three suborbital first stage boosters and an orbital second stage. Trajectory data will be provided directly to NTIA, USAF, and NASA. All downrange Earth stations are receive only. All operations are pre-coordinated with the range. The permit also stated, launch vehicle communications for mission launching from LC-39A Kennedy Space Center and the drone ship recovery of two side core boosters, center core is expendable with a water landing. Well, the most special point in all of that is that this will be the first time both boosters will land on drone ships. After booster separation, they'll reorient engines first and go through entry, but they won't perform a boost backburn to return to land. Instead, they'll land on two drone ships. The reason for this distinction is its payload. The EchoStar 24 satellite is extremely weighty, the heaviest geostationary communication satellite ever launched, weighing over 9 tons. Additionally, the mission involves a high-energy orbit in close proximity to GEO called GTO. GTO is a highly elliptical Earth orbit with an apogee of 42,164 kilometers or 26,199 miles or 35,786 kilometers, 22,236 miles above sea level, which corresponds to the geostationary altitude. The period of a standard geosynchronous transfer orbit is about 10 and a half hours. While some geosatellites are launched direct to that orbit, often the launch vehicle lacks the power to put both the rocket and satellite into that orbit. Instead of extra fuel being added to the satellite, the launch vehicle launches to a geostationary transfer orbit, then the satellite circulizes at orbit at geostationary altitude. This benefits from staging the launch vehicles and the mass of its structure and engines do not need to be lifted up to a circular geostationary altitude. Now back to the main content, over the years SpaceX has conducted numerous successful drone ship landings, particularly with Falcon 9, however SpaceX has never done a double drone ship landing before. Actually SpaceX offers three options depending on launch requirements, landing on land, landing at sea, or expending the first stage in order of increased performance and cost. Any Falcon flights launched in the geostationary orbit or exceeding escape velocity require landing at sea or expending the first stage. Less demanding launches from Florida can return to landing zones 1 and 2 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, while less demanding launches from California can return to landing zone 4. Around three quarters of recovered Falcon boosters land at sea as of 2022. SpaceX has three operational drone ships. Just read the instructions, JRTI and a shortfall of Gravitas, ASOG. 
operating in the Atlantic for launches for Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, and of course, I Still Love You, O-C-I-S-L-Y, it operates in the Pacific for supporting missions from Vandenberg Space Force Base. JRTI operated in the Pacific for Vandenberg from 2016 to 2019 before leaving the port of LA in August of 2019. The ASDS are autonomous vessels capable of precision positioning, originally stated to be within 3 meters, which is 9.8 feet, even under storm conditions, using GPS position information and four diesel-powered azimuth thrusters. In addition to the autonomous operating mode, the ships may also be telerobotically controlled. The azimuth thrusters are hydraulic propulsion outdrive units with modular diesel hydraulic drive power units, and they're manufactured by Thrustmaster, a marine equipment manufacturer in Texas. The returning first stage must not only land within the confines of the deck surface, but also deal with ocean swells and GPS errors. SpaceX equips the ships with a variety of sensor and measurement technology to gather data on the booster return and landing attempt, including commercial off-the-shelf GoPro cameras. At the center of the ASDS landing pads is a circle that encloses the SpaceX stylized X, and X marks the spot landing point. On this upcoming mission, we can expect to see JRTI and ASOG both in position for the landing. Let's delve into the details of this noteworthy payload. ECHOSTAR recently confirmed its long-awaited Jupiter-3 satellite and it should be ready for a Falcon Heavy launch in August. The 500 gigabyte per second America's Focus satellite originally slated to launch in 2021 before production delays at Maxar Technologies is needed to relieve broadband capacity constraints that have led to subscriber losses for the operator. Broadband subscribers at EchoStar service provider subsidiary Hughes fell 51,000 over the three months ending March 31st to about 1.18 million, the company reported May 9th. Existing U.S. subscribers are using about 15% more bandwidth on average year-on-year, -year, compounding the operator's capacity woes as fierce competition takes a toll on consumer subscriber levels. EchoStar set a strategy to allocate existing capacity to more profitable consumer areas and enterprise customers help temper subscriber levels in Latin America. Still consolidated revenue fell 12.3% year over year to $439.6 million for the first quarter of 2023. Adjusted EBITDA, or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization dropped 18.6% to $135 million. EchoStar said it expects Maxar to ship Jupiter-3 to the Florida launch site in June. Delivering Jupiter-3 in June would save Maxar from making additional payments to EchoStar under a compensation plan agreed last year due to the production delays. The KA-band satellite, which would more than double the capacity of Jupiter-2 that went up in 2017, is slated to enter commercial service in the final three months of 2023. Although SpaceX has reserved an August launch slot, the operator warned this remains, quote, subject to preemption by certain higher priority government launches, end quote. Falcon Heavy is also lined up to launch NASA's Psyche Asteroid Exploration Mission in October. Both missions have suffered delays amid payload readiness and range scheduling issues. This will be the final mission for 2023, yet 2024 promises to be equally eventful. Five missions already on the schedule, all for NASA. Among them is Europa Clipper, a mission that will undertake an extensive survey of Jupiter's icy moon using a sophisticated suite of scientific instruments to examine whether Europa possesses the necessary conditions to support life. The mission aims to generate high-resolution images of Europa's surface, evaluate its composition, detect any signs of recent or current geological activity, measure the thickness of its icy shell, and much, much more. This is a very exciting prospect, and we anticipate it in the months ahead. In short, before Starship entered active duty, Falcon Heavy still remains a formidable beast. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget, share your ideas in the comments section below. Your support motivates us to create more quality videos. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time.